Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. Happy afternoon. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started today. Thank you, everyone who is joining us. I recognize so many faces on the call. Um, so I think this is going to be a really great discussion. Uh, my name is Ashley Jennings. For those of uh, who I don't know on the call, I am the managing director of the Texas Innovation Center. And the Texas Innovation Center serves as a venture studio on campus for all faculty, researchers, graduate students, postdocs um, who want to take their intellectual property and potentially create a new venture out of it. Um, and so we wrap resources around researchers, including these types of workshops, um, and we run a Texas biodesign program um, that fits under our health tech med tech portfolio. Um, so without further ado, oh, and if you ever wanna come in and utilize our resources, we're open Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we absolutely love working um, with startup founders. Let me just let someone in real fast. And um, we're super passionate about um, helping you not just launch, but scale and um, have a business at the end of the day. So please come find us if you need anything. Um, without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, the JGS Group is a strategic clinical regulatory and reimbursement consultancy for med tech and life science companies. The firm combines program for development, implementation, and commercialization, decreasing time to global market. We have Mr. Robert Longyear here today, who's going to lead us through this presentation. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. Remain respectful in the chat, please. Um, and yeah, I'll let Robert take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Robert Longyear. Uh, I'm a consultant here at JGS Group, and uh, it's fantastic to be here today to speak to you about um, sort of taking a concept or even a more uh, further along product and trying to get it into the U.S. healthcare system. So, um, you know, all of our, our greatest, most innovative uh, companies and uh, clients uh, usually stem from a fair amount of uh, significant academic research. Um, and so we love working with universities and uh, companies that's been out of universities. Uh, we do a lot of work with companies from Johns Hopkins. We do a lot of work from companies uh, with companies from MIT and uh, some of the New York schools as well. So um, it's uh, fantastic to be here speaking to you about this today. Um, I usually like to begin by saying this is an extremely complex space. Um, so what I'm telling you may be overly simplistic for the sake of this presentation, um, and there may be more nuance to what I'm saying, um, and in some circumstances, we're getting a little bit further into the weeds, um, but there's a lot of uh, sort of additional nuance when you do that. So um, we always uh, sort of assess and speak with companies about their technologies that are related to their specific environments. So um, when we're working with companies, there's uh, sometimes like certain pathways that are not common or not discussed during this presentation that may be more applicable. So um, if I say something here and you're like, oh no, like I don't have a pathway or that's not going to work for me um, or my technology, then don't fret too much. There's usually ways for us to uh, to, to problem solve there. So um, that's usually how I caveat things. Um, and I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, what do we do? And what are really the four parts of launching a technology for a medical device, pharmaceutical product, a biologic product, a digital health technology software as a medical device, um, all of these sort of areas that are typically regulated by the Food and Drug Administration um, or uh, other state, local, and federal regulators. Um, we're very focused on working with our customers to develop clinical evidence and plans for the necessary clinical evidence for both regulatory submittals and to support market entry. Um, and I'm going to kind of differentiate those two uh, parallel paths uh, as we go through this presentation here. Um, we help and advise companies and uh, innovators and product owners on how to navigate the, at the FDA process typically. Um, we help our customers think about commercialization plans, which may involve reimbursement navigation of existing coding structures, existing systems of payment, or uh, the development of new pricing models or um, opportunities to actually still bring a device or technology to the market. Um, so all of these things go hand in hand, they play off of each other, um, but they're often not uh, sort of a part of the same uh, typical approaches. And so we like to 
um, kind of combine all four of these items together. Reimbursement, regulatory work, and clinical evidence are all moving parts that influence the outcome of, uh, or I should say, the success or, or not success of, of technologies that go into the market. There's plenty of uh, examples of uh, software, medical devices, pharmaceutical products um, that are quite good. They may even work, but they fail to reach the market because these specific areas were not carefully paid attention to or they were ignored outright. And so it's very important that when we're looking at taking these concepts or technologies that were, were, were focused on these particular areas here. Um, let's see here. The healthcare system changes quite frequently, uh, although many of us would say that it doesn't change frequently enough or it's kind of slow to adopt and adapt. Um, it, there's lots of different uh, nuanced and detailed areas that shift uh, rather frequently as new policies are and, and uh, legislation is passed or as new rules come down from the regulatory agencies. Um, the U.S. healthcare system is also not sort of a one-size-fits-all or universally accessible uh, area, right? You don't just kind of get your FDA approval and then you're suddenly able to sell your product in the market. Um, there's really multiple different systems up to, let's say, 10 and sometimes hundreds of different systems that you're actually individually navigating. Um, and so that really is uh, really how, how we help our customers navigate that once even regulatory submissions are done. Typically, the FDA is actually the easiest part of the process. After you get out of the FDA, then we have to figure out who's going to pay for it, who's going to use it, how are we going to get it to them, how are we going to produce this technology or this particular uh, innovation? And you know, where are we going to start meeting and encountering those organizations that we now have to go through? Um, we also have a uh, in the United States a weird mix of sort of commercial business oriented healthcare delivery and payment organizations as well as government payers. Um, and navigating both of those are very very different areas, and it's something that uh, we we deal with with our customers every single day. So the two major groups we're going to be talking about today as we go through this presentation are going to be the payers, who pays for it, how do they pay for it, when do they pay for it, for whom do they pay for it, um, and the regulators, right? They are very concerned about, let's make sure this works, and if you're going to make any claim about your technology, something that it does, or a population of patients that it's a good fit for, they really are have complete oversight over those areas there. Um, these two groups really do not speak to each other. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, I got through the FDA, and now Medicare is going to pay for my device. That is not at all. The processes aren't linked. The agencies don't talk to each other. They're really, honestly, in very different geographic areas from each other. Um, and so that's something that uh, we have to dispel a lot with our customers when we end up working with them because, um, you know, there's no real carefully planned out pathway here where you, you know, follow the rules of the FDA and then suddenly Medicare says, oh yeah, this is great. Here's your code. Here's your payment rate. And, you know, have fun selling your product in the market. Congratulations. Um, that, that doesn't happen um, as much as we would like it to happen. Um, and so that's something that will be important as we go through this presentation that you keep in mind that um, one pathway does not necessarily lead to or influence other pathways, although sometimes they can't. Clinical evidence. So I suspect that the folks on this call, given that you're affiliated with the university, will be very strong in the clinical evidence space um, and in the research space here. So um, I probably won't spend too much time on this uh, study design concepts and things like that, that uh, you're all very familiar with, but I will go through it. What does the FDA care about? What do insurance companies care about? What do uh, government payers care about? Um, as well as your potential customers, physicians, health systems, hospitals, surgeons, um, what do they want to see before they start using this technology? Um, your clinical data is not just to meet the bare minimum requirements of the FDA. It's often also to support your go-to-market strategy. Um, everybody, before they adopt something, are going to want to see that this works. Um, publishing academically in journals is a great way to actually market and communicate your product right to people who are reading those journals. 
Um, and so it's it's more than just let's do this because the FDA says we need to do it. Um, it's about really proving to the market that this works. And through that process of proving the efficacy and effectiveness of your technology or your innovation, you're really able to then garner more support from insurance companies, from Medicare and from state Medicaid payers. Um, so number one, it has to be a statistically sound um, study design. So you have to have a sufficient sample size, it has to be appropriately powered study, um, and you need to be able to have the right outcome metrics there. Um, obviously that's, that's very, very important, but um, we work with a lot of companies that um, one need to figure out what the FDA actually wants. Um, and so that guidance is usually very clear, or we go and look at similar technologies that have already made it through and sort of blazed that trail. Um, through the FDA, we'll look at their submission, we'll look at the studies they did, we'll look at the sample size that they use, we look at the geographic diversity of their patient enrollments, um, and that helps us sort of navigate this process. We really want to uh, really match what the FDA has already said that they expect for your particular product classification. Um, and that, again, includes things like sample size. Um, we also want to make sure that it actually works, right? So um, like, we don't want it to just be okay. We don't want to just prove that it's safe. You actually have to prove that it's safe and efficacious. Um, and so that's really where that study design is very important. Um, and those results are very important for future adoption, not just sort of that regulatory hurdle that we have to get through. Uh, study design has to be reliable. So um, typically, again, the study type is going to be uh, largely dictated by um, devices and technologies that have gone through the FDA previously. Um, if there is nothing that looks like your technology, innovation, or device, then um, that's called going in de novo. Um, you're going to go through a pathway where you will then blaze the trail and have uh, the opportunity to really work with the folks at the Food and Drug Administration um, and with potentially your, your regulatory consultants to create a study that proves that your technology works for the particular condition, indication, or purpose of use for um, the, the patients that ultimately will be receiving it. As with any clinical study um, that's going through, uh, that, that involves human subjects, um, there you do have to go through an IRB. Um, Many organizations, obviously, if you're affiliated with a university, you have an, an IRB that's at your institution. Um, a lot of sort of companies that are able to obtain funding may go for a private IRB um, such that they don't have to wait many, many months um, to actually get approval there. So um, that's, an, that's an option. But the FDA does require those human subject protections for data that is used to submit for an FDA uh, process. Um, and then those results need to be generalizable to the United States. So we work with a lot of companies that do studies in Europe or do studies in Asia. And uh, they ask us, can we use my data for um, you know, a US FDA submission? Um, the answer is, uh, the, the technical answer is that the population has to be phenotypically and genotypically um, sort of matching the US population or representative of the US population, which typically means that you have to do a study in the United States. Um, so some companies have tried to make the argument, you know, with Europeans that, you know, it's fairly um, sort of universally applicable um, to a certain portion of the United States, um, but that is often not accepted by the FDA. Um, and so that's something that's that's very, very important here. Um, and then the endpoints need to be relevant to um, what you're doing um, with the actual device, like what is the actual clinical outcome that you're looking for here? Um, and um, in addition to that, uh, you may want to include certain endpoints or certain study uh, outcome measures that are relevant for your future commercialization efforts. Um, and so the um, purpose of that is essentially convincing insurance companies that it makes sense. So can we put in an analysis um, in some of your clinical studies that uh, show return on investment or reductions in healthcare utilization? Can we put in endpoints there that um, are of particular interest to those commercial payers that prove that this is solving an unmet need um, and it's something that uh, reduces long-term healthcare costs? Robert, we have a question. Yes. Is a sample size determined at the pre-sub? Um, so, so basically, 
anytime you meet for like a pre-sub meeting with the FDA, um, they're not going to necessarily like say, oh, it needs to be 3000 patients. Like you will go present to them and you will say, hey, this is what we're thinking. And they'll say, uh-huh, or no. Um, and they will say like, that doesn't work for us. So they're, it's not going to be so much of a collaborative effort. You're kind of going to present to them and they're either going to accept it or they're not going to accept it. Um, you can present that at the pre-sub. Um, and that's really ultimately where you're um, going to determine, essentially what you're going to get there is like, is this the right classification, the pathway? And then that's going to be pretty well defined by the previous um, 510k submissions for that particular device classification. Um, but there's a little bit of nuance there. Um, if it's something that's new, like really, really new, and the FDA hasn't seen it before, then they'll be a little bit more collaborative because you have to actually define that that classification, the pathway. Um, but typically the, the requirements are more, more onerous there. Um, so they may require a larger sample size because of the uncertainty around that particular device or technology that you're actually submitting. Um, the benefit of that sometimes strategically from a business perspective is that you can you can define the category and therefore make the hurdle for future competitors more difficult uh, if you are doing sort of the first submission in that in that group there. Let me look and see. Uh, class 2, 510K, that does not require a clinical trial. Do we still need to have the sample size discussion? Um, no. So if you're not doing a clinical trial, um, then you you may have to have some clinical validation that requires a certain sample size. But um, if you are not going through a 510K approach and it is exempt from a 510K, you're just really going to register with the with the FDA. Um, and there'll be some like, like obviously uh, production controls that are required um, as with anything that becomes registered or approved by the FDA. Um, but if you're not doing a clinical study, then it'll probably be less relevant. One more question. Can you get 510 if tech is used in one specialty, but not in the one you intend to use? If tech is used in one specialty, but not in one that you intend to use. Um, let's see here. If the tech is used in one specialty, but not in the one you intend to use. Um, so it, the FDA approves things based on the indication. So it, there's a world where you're going after approval with the technology, and I assume by specialty, you mean a medical specialty. So uh, if the nephrologists are using the technology for something, but you're a cardiologist and you want to use it now, um, if you're using it for a different purpose, for a different indication, um, then you'll have to go through a separate classification for through the FDA, right? So it could be the same technology and you'll say, hey, this other use case and submission for nephrology is using the same technology. That's my technology predicate, but my actual use case and indication for use is this separate filing here. Um, now, that's when there's a disease. It's for the intention of a diagnosis or the intention of um, like a specific condition, like a treatment or or a disease there's a whole class class of devices that are really just measurement devices right so you may be measuring something that's used by the nephrologists um, and you're still measuring that same metric or output from the device in cardiology but it's being used differently by the clinician that's okay if the if the device is the the technology is approved for that particular use case. Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's kind of a nuanced um, response. And I guess I can't hear you. So um, put it in the chat if, if yes. that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So what does the FDA have authority over? Um, foods, drugs, biologics, medical devices, um, electronic products, cosmetics, veterinary products, and tobacco products. Um, the FDA has also recently, as of 2020, asserted control over software that is functioning as a medical device. So that is sort of a new category. It's still an emerging space. Um, that includes things like digital therapeutics um, and clinical decision support, AI algorithms, things like that, that are being used uh, to actually treat or, or diagnose or uh, provide a probability of something 
Um, and so the FDA does have submission pathways for that through typical medical device routes, um, which is very interesting. It's actually what I do more so than some of these other areas. So software is sort of my area of expertise, but um, we have people on the team that do a lot of work with uh, hardware medical devices, biologics, um, tissue regeneration, um, and, and things like that. So um, basically your device, if it has an indication of use, um, will certainly fall under the FDA. Um, there are some easier pathways where we could sometimes look at something and say, well, we, we don't need to necessarily say that it is used as a diagnostic aid or a diagnostic device for um, this particular disease. We can kind of cut the actual definition of what the device is off at a different point. So sometimes what we what we see is like there's actually a output from your device or technology that is um, fundamentally not necessarily tied to a particular condition. And so that can sometimes lead to an easier FDA um, uh, approval process or registration process. Um, and so like, it's really important to think about where we're actually drawing the lines around your, around what is the device we're submitting? Um, because there's a world where the claims you make about the device um, is, is one thing, it, it measures a particular concept or, or metric, whereas um, a physician can come along and say, I want to measure that metric and using my clinical judgment, um, I'm going to use it for this particular use case. And so um, that's where uh, the FDA's uh, authority over marketing claims um, is really what we're looking for here. Like, how are you going to market this device? Um, but that doesn't necessarily supersede the independent clinical judgment of a practicing physician or healthcare provider. Um, and so that's something that is really important when we're thinking about particularly software products and diagnostic products. Um, it's a little bit different when we're thinking about treatments because the indications for use and the particular treatment targets are usually really clear. Um, and it's it's not so much of a, of a challenge or a, sort of a, um, a dance that you play with figuring out how you want to actually discuss and talk about your device. The medical devices fall under three categories. Uh, you have class one devices, typically low risk um, devices there, um, bandages, handheld surgical equipment, non electric wheelchairs. Um, and then you have class two devices, where so uh, quite a few of the medical devices that we see end up fitting. Um, it's a little bit less onerous than a class three device, which requires massive sample sizes. So, um, you know, with a class three device, you're looking at something that is quite dangerous. It's implanted. It's a it's a serious procedure, or it results in some sort of serious diagnosis. In which case, you are um, like in that class three range. But it's mostly implantable medical devices, things that can cause harm if used improperly. Um, most things that are not falling in that type of category, fall into a class two. Um, class one are, like I said, very simple um, technologies that um, are more often referred to as like supplies or like standard me measurement devices. Um, the class will determine the intensity of the regulatory requirements. Um, and that's something that we work a lot with our customers on, like people who are on the um, on the fringe between a class two and a class three or people who are on the fringe between a class one and a class two um, and trying to say like, which one makes sense. Now, this is also where reimbursement comes into play, which I'll talk about a little bit later in that your class and your choice of a predicate device or your choice of the classification for your particular technology does influence sometimes what reimbursement you're able to get. Um, it is less about the actual class itself and the regulatory pathway. It's much more about the intended use of your technology. Um, and that's where we get into some of the nuance and actual strategy elements here, as opposed to just following the instructions that have been set out by the regulatory agencies. Um, this is the publicly available pathway map for um, medical devices. So um, we look for the proper classification. There's there's publicly listed products that fall under uh, various different uh, classifications for the intended use. Um, 
and then we go through and uh, look at these various different processes here. So class one is exempt from filings so that you're just registering with the FDA. You're putting your company name, information on the website so that they can contact you if they decide that your device is, you know, potentially dangerous, not efficacious, uh, and or, um, you know, really should be classified as a class two or a class three. Um, and then for class two, class three, and some class ones, um, you're really going to go through a process of trying to identify a predicate device um, in terms of the technology. So you're going to go through there and say, hey, look, our device really does what this does, and it has the intent same intended use. And so you're going to fall under that 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 uh, category. And like I said, we'll go through, we'll request the filings from the companies that have gone before you that have established that category and classification, and we'll review what they did and try and match that as close as possible, typically. Um, basically, once you've identified a predicate, you're going to just show substantial equivalence there, which may require sometimes larger clinical studies, or it may just require that you're going to show technically that it is equivalent. The outputs from your device are um, is equally sensitive or specific to the readings or the outcomes from those other devices that are in that pathway. Um, similarly, with the if you cannot find a predicate, um, you're going to go ahead and apply for um, basically a, it's called a de novo submission. Um, and you're going to have to show safety and, and e efficacy um, as well as now at this point effectiveness um, for sort of post market monitoring. But um, at that point, you're actually establishing that that category and that classification. And so there'll be a little bit more back and forth with the FDA. How do you decide between a PMA and a 510k de novo? Um, really, the FDA is going to kind of tell you which one you fall into. Um, and that's a very nuanced question there um, in terms of like which one you're actually going to go through. Um, a lot of times that's to do with the acuity of the device. Or sorry, the, uh, the potential risk associated with the device is the proper term. Do you need a predicate device when registering class one with the FDA? Um, you will need to pick a product classification for class one. So um, you will have still have to go through and look for the classification, the intended use of your device. So if you have a special bandage, right, you're going to go look for the closest fitting category there and you're going to register under that particular classification. But it's not technically a predicate device. It's it's a it's a classification of of technologies. Like if you have a you know you developed a better uh, crutch for people who need it to walk and take weight off of their legs, then you'll go under the class one crutches um, group that most closely matches your um, technology there. I see a question. Have you had any device with multiple features and combined indication of use that each feature has its own predicate and indication? How is that processed? And maybe each feature has its own reimbursement code. Um, yes. So you might refer to that as a compound device. Um, typically, if you're doing multiple different things, right, and you want to either measure different concepts, you're doing different diagnoses, or you're doing different treatments, you're going to have a separate 510k for all of them. And that's really where you're going to draw the lines around the devices differently. So you're going to draw one line around the particular functionality for this particular outcome, and you're going to draw one line over here, and you're going to have to go into those, those use uh, classifications for those particular indications or those particular purposes of use that you, you have ultimately. Um, so hopefully that's, that's helpful. Um, because the FDA has very clear rules. Um, and if you are doing slightly different things, um, then you know, you'll have separate situations. Now, in terms of reimbursement code, you absolutely will probably have different reimbursement codes, but it depends how different it is. So in some circumstances, the three things you're measuring may all roll up under a particular procedure, may roll up under a particular um, like surgical um, bundle. It may roll up under a particular CBT code. Let's see here. Class 2, 510K. Okay, answer those questions. Good. Up to date here. And I will say, this is like an overly simplistic diagram here. Um, there are special categories under class 2 and class 3 and class 1, some of which require 510K, some of which do not. Um, and so this is this is a little bit uh, an area that's a little oversimplified, and it really should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Let's see here. So the, I, I mentioned this already. The FDA also regulates uh, software as a medical device. Um, this is a very exciting emerging area. There's a lot of people who are working on digital therapeutics. Um, Pair Therapeutics was the first uh, digital therapeutics company to push something through the FDA. Unfortunately, just, they just went out of business um, for uh, inability to actually obtain reimbursement from the U.S. healthcare system. Um, and so that was part, uh, from our perspective, failure for them to plan um, and part failure for them to uh, really sort of communicate the value of their technologies through clinical evidence. Um, and, you know, happy to talk about that more, but... Um, there are other more successful software platforms that have gone through as well. Um, so Endeavor RX is a technology company that was um, approved by the FDA for pediatric indication of use for treatment of ADHD. Um, that's a really cool technology that's made it through. It's basically a video game um, for children. So there's a lot of innovation going on in this space. Um, it is very nuanced. And so there are certain things that the FDA does want to see typical medical device evidence for. And there are some that they say, I don't actually need to see this, but here are the rules. And so um, typically the rules, uh, the, the rule of thumb for whether your software needs to go through the FDA is, is there a black box where something's happening and producing something that would typically be the production of a medical device for diagnostic purposes um, or for treatment purposes? Um, or is it presenting all the information such that a clinician is actually able to digest that? And uh, should they have done the reasonable work to come up with the same outcome? Um, you know, is that sort of how you're presenting the information there? So whether there's a black box or not, um, that has to do with clinical decision support algorithms, um, things that, you know, share information back to patients. So an app where a patient maybe inputs information and then it spits out a diagnosis. Like there's certain things that we work on with companies to help them either go through the FDA successfully or kind of skirt it by, by sort of following the rules that they've set forth for uh, software as a medical device. Okay. So this is something that is comes from experience. This is not uh, typically written anywhere. Um, the FDA has no jurisdiction over reimbursements. The FDA only looks at safety and efficacy. Um, and you can make it through the FDA and be really excited about that. And as I sort of already foreshadowed this and come out the other side and nobody could pay for it. Um, and so picking the right predicate is really important because sometimes when you're getting mapped into particular existing codes for reimbursement, your, your predicate and intended use will factor into whether or not you get approved to actually fall under that code. This happens a lot for medical device, durable medical equipment. Um, like that's something that is important, but it's not officially linked. Um, so that's something that is, is important to take a look at. Um, payers also, even if the FDA approves something, can still sit there and classify it as experimental. Um, and so I've seen this happen with so many technologies where the FDA approves them. The company is like, great, we've proven that our technology works and should be adopted by clinicians, um, but they don't quite have a large enough sample. They had just enough to kind of prove to the FDA that this was safe and effective um, or safe and efficacious. And um, then they get out in the real world and they see a medical policy come down from Anthem that says, this is an experimental thing. We don't pay for it. Um, and so your clinical evidence at that point is not just to get through that FDA hurdle, but you have to prove to the medical directors at those insurance companies that this is something they should pay for. Um, and you have to sort of move the conversation around your technology from being an experimental new, new kind of concept uh, drug or new concept medical device or diagnostic tool into this is something that should be in clinical practice. That comes typically from academic publishing and studies. It comes from uh, acceptances and recommendations from key opinion leaders in your space. Um, it comes from professional medical societies accepting it. Um, that's why you see the big pharma companies going to all the uh, specialty society meetings and presenting their newest data and trying to compete for first-line therapy by proving that their technology works better for a particular indication than their competitors, right? Um, they have the money to do that. They, they have massive institutions that are built to do that. Um, so for small companies, you still have to kind of play that game, but um, you also have to play it a little bit smartly and with fewer resources because, or intelligently, smartly is not a word, um, intelligently with fewer resources. Um, and you still have to garner acceptance from the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics. You still have to go after um, that as uh, 
as sort of recommendations because um, the insurance companies typically don't want to pay for anything um, because it's an expense for them. But if the clinical evidence is there such that um, it, it is accepted and physicians do say, I want to use this and I'm going to defend my use of this, then they do start to have to pay for it um, in a way that um, they, they may not want to, but um, they, they can't outright sort of uh, compete with that clinical judgment, even though they do sometimes. Um, similarly, if it's a true unmet need, if it's a condition that doesn't have a current treatment or doesn't have good diagnostic pathways or processes, then um, you may be solving a problem for that insurance company, right? Um, you may be solving a problem for Medicare and for the physicians and the teams that actually work with patients every day. So in some circumstances, your device really may be a good fit and the alignment across the value alignment across the health system may be there. Um, and so some things are really good fit. Some things you have to prove more because people don't know it's a problem or they don't understand the problem. And that's really where publications are very important. And I see a question, what is the strategy if you don't have an option, you still have to do a CPT3 code in terms of getting FDA approval and reimbursement efficiently? Um, so it really depends on your device. Um, you know, you, you may still have to go through the FDA. There may be no classifications for you. You have to do an experimental, you know, class three or, or level three CPT code. Um, like that's still something that happens. Um, and in which case that's where the evidence comes along and you're really trying to say, Hey, you should pay for this. Um, once you have FDA approval, there's other options that open. So like, uh, we typically start the reimbursement process through Medicare because, um, we can apply, we can get the code, um, we can even get a rate assigned to it. And then that's going to flow into other fee schedules that are, uh, among the commercial insurers and that are among the, uh, state Medicaid fee schedules as well. Um, and that trickling process, once Medicare puts something on their fee schedule with a rate will happen over the course of like 18 to 24 months where you start to see it showing up on these other fee schedules and you start to see medical policies start coming out from the commercial insurers about whether they're gonna cover it or not. That's where your evidence is really important. Um, but at the same time, it's also like, how big of a problem is this? Um, are there other treatments that are working fine that you know, this, your, your technology, your device really doesn't, doesn't do much for, um, like it, that's where really like product market fit starts to come into play. We typically don't talk about that type of thing when launching companies in the biotech space, um, because you have the regulatory approval that sort of determines like, do you even get to go to market? And then we have like insurance companies and big institutions that decide if they're going to pay for it or not. But your product market fit, like, is this actually going to get adopted? Is it solving a big problem? Really does matter. And that's when we get to start using real business approaches. We get to start asking ourselves, how can we talk about this product? How can we market this product? How can we convince insurance companies and actually go meet with them and say, hey, look, these are the outcomes we expect. We built this model. We have this evidence to support it. Um, you're going to have to go out there and often do those types of conversations. Um, but we hope that typically there's a good reimbursing existing code um, that we can map into. But if you can't map into something and you do get one of those new experimental codes, then um, you know it's a. To be honest with you, it is a. It's a fight. Um, and there's ways that you can do it, but it is always uh, uh, to quote somebody else who I know talks about this. It's a bit of a slugfest. Reimbursement. So we have uh, three major markets that we think about when we talk about reimbursement here. So Medicare, this is for those of you that have devices or technologies or innovations that um, affect people greater than 65 years old. Um, it is a national program, which is very helpful because Medicare, you can go to one place, you can say, hey, um, we want this, this is the code that we've received, or this is the code that we want. And this is the reimbursement rate that we suggest, um, you know, can you consider paying for this Medicare um, for like technologies that have to do with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's, um, like you're really mostly dealing with Medicare and some commercial insurers. And so um, like those types of technologies have a little bit easier pathway to market. Um, we work with a lot of pediatric focused companies. And with those, we're really not even dealing with Medicare. We still go through Medicare because we want to leverage their fee schedule and rate setting capabilities to try and push it into these other markets. But um, you're really dealing with commercially insured uh, sort of employer-based insurance for children and Medicaid. Medicaid covers about 50% of the kids in the United States. Um, so 
commercial insurance is um, typically received through the uh, employer in the United States, but also there's some individual exchanges and markets that are available. Um, and so in those circumstances, um, they typically pay the most, um, but uh, it's it's not always the case. But um, these are really, you're, you're dealing with this on a company by company basis, and you're using your evidence and your marketing strategy to try and convince them to put favorable medical policies in place. Um, but sometimes, like I said, it really comes down to like, what problem are you actually solving clinically? What problem are you actually solving for potentially that insurance company's management of that condition? Um, for example, um, like we've worked with a company that has a diagnostic, a genetic test that um, has historically had for a patient type that has historically not had very good diagnostic, like objective diagnostic measures. And in that case, even though it's an expensive genetic test, the insurance companies are spending so much money on human diagnostic visits that they're open to actually like sort of uh, streamlining that diagnostic process. And so um, like we, we sometimes find that and that's really helpful. Um, but this is where we do research on what the current state of the world is in that particular clinical pathway. We look at claims data to see how insurance companies are paying for it, how hospitals are coding for it, how physicians are coding for that particular service. And we have to re really put the puzzle together. Um, Medicaid safety net program, uh, it's a federal state partnership. Uh, federal government foots part of the bill and sets some requirements for states. Uh, states put the other part of the bill um, and they have some flexibility to choose what they do and don't do. Um, and so uh, every state, there's 50 different Medicaid programs, plus there's some in Guam and Puerto Rico. Um, so we have to sort of navigate acceptance or lack of acceptance across all 50 US states. Um, and the good news is, is the fee schedules are all publicly available. Um, so they typically flow down from Medicare to the states after a period of time, six to, like I said, 18 months, sometimes two years. Um, and you can actually go see what that coverage rate is for the Medicaid uh, state that has chosen to adopt it or not adopt it. Uh, if the device falls under a DRG code, would it be more conversation with the hospital to get absorbed into their bundled costs? Um, the answer is yes. So um, for uh, hospital-based um, devices, technologies that do fall under a DRG or a bundled payment, um, there's two options. One, Maybe your device saves money with what they're already doing or time, in which case that's a natural sort of business fit into how their, their revenue process already works. Um, in some circumstances, you can actually go to Medicare and request a technology bump for that DRG or for that particular um, you know, prospective payment system where you're saying, hey, look, this is a new technology. It falls under the procedure in this particular DRG and it has better efficacy profile, but it is more expensive to deliver. And so you can actually request that there's sort of a technology enhancement payment that goes into the coding structure for a DRG. Um, so that's actually a pretty good pathway, um, particularly if your device saves time or is a little cheaper, or if it's so much better and you know every surgeon that's doing a particular procedure is going to want to get paid for it, or every hospital for a particular patient journey is going to want to use that device, then, um, then we go to Medicare and we say, hey, look, you got to bump this up a little bit. Um, there's limits to how much you can bump it up, but um, that is a procedure that does exist. Even beyond Medicaid, commercial insurance, and Medicare, there are submarkets, and sometimes your patient population is so specific or niche that it mostly fits into one of the submarkets. Um, and there's different strategies for navigating each of these different positions here. Um, oh, I'll go back. Each of the different um, sort of submarkets. So in Medicaid, sometimes you have a state fee for service situation where it's just the state puts it on the fee schedule, and you submit the claim to the state, and uh, you get paid for it at the rate that they claim. Sometimes you're dealing with private insurance companies that receive capitated payments to administer the Medicaid program in the state. Um, those conversations and those strategies, they're a little bit different. Um, commercial insurance, um, sometimes you are um, dealing with small group uh, patients primarily. Sometimes you're dealing with um, you know, individual uh, employer markets. Um, typically insurance and commercial is fairly homogenous in terms of the um, like patient populations that are, are found there. Um, we usually find, like I said, people over the age of 65 um, are, are on Medicare, um, eligible for Medicare, as well as um, if your device or technology is for end-stage renal disease, um, even children who um, end up with end-stage renal disease for whatever reason actually are eligible for Medicare. 
Um, that's one of the uh, groups that is sort of carved into Medicare aside from the age eligibility requirement. Um, but if you're dealing with sort of a device that's primarily focused on pediatrics, then you're 50% Medicaid, 50% commercial insurance. Um, the good news is for a lot of our customers um, or clients, I should say, um, if, if we have issues with coding or there's no existing codes or you get mapped into a code that doesn't get paid, which happens sometimes, um, if your technology actually solves a significant problem um, or improves on something, there's other ways that you can receive payment. There's, there's value-based payment arrangements where um, payers are increasingly paying the, the blue box organizations here with different incentives. So um, it's not always a one-for-one -one payment for a device or a procedure or time. Um, sometimes they're saying, hey, look, you are a practice, a primary care practice that manages primarily older adults, and we're going to pay you $400 a month flat rate to manage all the care for the patients that are assigned to you, um, in which case those organizations actually have the cash on hand a lot of times to be able to invest in technologies and solutions that they otherwise would not because there's no reimbursement code for it. So there is hope for devices and technologies that have difficulty navigating the reimbursement and coding situation. Um, we have worked on some of those technologies where we've built some business models going after some of the value-based payment arrangements. Determining where and who is going to be using your device is a surprisingly big catch point for some people. Um, a lot of times there's people who build a device that um, works for a patient and a particular disease or a particular process in the human body. And that's really what they've focused on. And then they start to look outward and say, okay, I want to sell this now. We have to sort of figure out who's going to use it. And in some circumstances, it may be across, you know, hospital services um, and ambulatory surgical centers. Sometimes it may be only physician office, uh, outpatient focused condition that cardiologists are seeing, right? So we do have to map to who's going to use it and what the setting of care is going to be for that particular technology, because that influences our ability to go after reimbursement in certain areas um, and can often lead to the success or failure of particular technologies if they try to go after a specialty, a subspecialty, or a place of service that it get the procedure gets done, but you know it doesn't get paid for very well, as opposed to finding another use case for it in a different area that may receive more reimbursement. Can you go more into point of service related to ICD-10 and DRG? Yes, I can do that. And I will do that a little bit later. The other thing that's really important is determining whether your device or technology is a cost center or a revenue center. Um, so like the DRG conversation earlier, if your device is like 10 times more expensive than what they're doing right now and marginally better clinically, um, it turns into a big cost center and adoption is likely to be low. Um, if it becomes a revenue center because you, you know, make that procedure more effective and it saves the, the time for the provider and they're going to receive the same reimbursement for that service, then um, that facility or organization or physician may eke out additional margin and therefore it may fuel adoption of your technology. Um, we have three parts here, coding, coverage, and payment. Um, coding is how we're identifying that procedure. That's your, your CPT code or DRG code that we're, we're, we've been discussing. Um, coverage is, you know, when, where, and for whom do we actually pay for this? And then payment is typically the rate. What are we actually paying for this? And, you know, how are we actually submitting the claims such that we're going to get the rate that we want um, for that particular service or procedure? And, and truthfully, this seems like this. there's a lot of structure to this process, but to be honest with you, there's not. Um, it really comes from experience and, and going to the right people and going to the right places. And sometimes it's even who you get on the other side of the table when you're negotiating this. Um, so it's not, unfortunately, a situation where you submit an application and there's a fair and reasonable economic evaluation of your technology and that gets adopted and then suddenly everybody pays for it. Um, we wish that that was the case, but this is an absolute, um, you know, it's a fight. Um, and by fight, I mean, is a well thought out strategic um, strategy that gets executed with a lot of different uh, organizations and uh, entities. 
So we typically start at CMS because there is more of an application and a clear process in place here. So um, the the rules set down by CMS really only apply for Medicare and sometimes for Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, however, private payers most often follow Medicare's lead in coverage decisions. So um, they will often take them now. They're, they're more likely to say, I'm not going to pay for this than Medicare is, um, but they will at least take the code and the rate that Medicare suggests, and they will use it for a period of time until they start to say it's too expensive or I want to incentivize the adoption of this more readily. Um, codes maintained by CMS are designed for use by both private and government payers. Um, that's That should be clear by now. Um, and then the reimbursement process, like I said, always begins at CMS for the most part. If you're lucky and you're focused on a condition that's most prevalent in a 65 plus population, then you get to stay at Medicare and then sort of move into the commercial space a little bit. If you, like I said, are doing pediatrics or um, people that are below the age of 65, um, then you have to do all three, which is a little bit more onerous and quite a bit of work. Um, this is when we think about enablers of reimbursement. We're really focused, like I said, on, on Medicare first. Um, if we're going for a CPT code or a laboratory code, we're going to go through the AMA. Um, it's called the RUC committee. It's a joint committee between some of the specialty societies, the American Medical Association, and uh, some of the insurance companies like the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Um, as I say always here, it's probably not the best system to have the uh, physician specialty societies and the insurance companies sit on a panel to decide what they want to pay for or not. Um, you know, other countries have that sitting in independent uh, bodies that make recommendations for this, but um, we do have our interest groups making these decisions. So that's part of the reason why this is not necessarily a fair and reasonable and balanced economic process. So, um, you know, I like to say that because it's not necessarily good for our society. Um, but these are really the groups that we're going after. Um, and this is ultimately where the evidence comes into play. Um, there's a certain degree of luck as well. So, um, you know, getting the right read from the right people who end up making decisions and influencing other people, um, it really comes into play here. So, um, your, your evidence needs to be really sound. You need to communicate it clearly and you do need to get a little bit lucky sometimes. So here are the typical coding sets um, that are managed and maintained by various different groups. So um, hospital inpatient is covered by CPT code payments, um, MSDRG system, and the ICD-10 coding system or ICD-9 coding system. Um, ICD-10, ICD ICD-9 codes are your actual diagnosis codes. Um, the MSDRG is your sort of prospective uh, diagnostic related grouping um, payment system. So it, it it's a very complex uh, method of calculating the cost to the provider of nursing care and supplies and uh, a rate for staying in the hospital um, and certain procedures that are done at the hospitals um, based on that patient's uh, admission diagnosis. Um, and so the ICD-10 code really does influence those, those DRGs and which one you fall into. Um, the point of service question here is um, uh, basically a, a very good one. Um, so there's you can have the same procedure done in a couple of different places sometimes. So um, you can have the same procedure done in a hospital inpatient, a hospital outpatient, or an ambulatory surgical center. There is slightly different coding for each of those. Um, and that is, it's largely the same procedure tied to the, to the diagnosis code that's submitted with the claim, but um, there's often very different um, coding used by those different locations um, and sometimes different rates. Um, they're typically, I think they're fairly consistent at this point, but um, sometimes you get different rates. Um, for all, the past 10, 15, 20 years, CMS has been encouraging um, certain procedures to get moved to an ambulatory surgical center center uh, location as sort of an outpatient procedure, as opposed to the hospitals that were for a while doing procedures and then keeping patients in for observation for a little longer and therefore eking out more revenue. Um, so there has been some incentive to move certain procedures into ambulatory surgical centers. Um, the place of service does also come into play when we're taking care of patients in the home. So if you have a technology that's mainly used for tele, like via telemedicine, 
or you have technologies that um, are used in the physician office or given to patients and sent home as a durable medical equipment. Um, those all factor in here and they're very, very detailed and complex procedures. And so it's hard for me to talk about this um, in any great detail other than what I have on the slide without specifically going into particular use cases. Um, does that answer your question about the DRGs? Um, otherwise I'd, I'd have to have some time with you off offline probably to get into specifics. Um, this is an example of CPT codes um, that are commonly used for software applications at this point, but um, this is here to illustrate that there's a code, the 99453, a description of what that code entails and a national payment amount um, from Medicare. Um, Medicare also has some variation in their payment amounts um, by geography and region. So uh, when we look at new technologies, innovations uh, that come through the FDA, um, we basically first try to assess if we can fit it into an existing CPT or, or um, a code set that we can uh, look at and say, are we happy with this reimbursement rate? Does this description actually match what the use case is for this particular technology? And it really comes down to that description and, and being off by a few words or slightly different sometimes gets you routed into that code. Um, there's various different organizations that we you know, will submit to and have uh, presentations to where we're asking to get mapped into a new code or to get a decision that says that we fit into an existing code. Um, and so sometimes like you end up in a situation where you want higher reimbursement, but that organization routes you into an existing code with lower reimbursement. So um, that's then when we start to get into business discussions about can we adjust the product to potentially have a different indication um, such that we're able to go after a higher, higher reimbursable event or are we going to have to try and figure out ways from a business perspective to reduce manufacturing costs such that we can make it work with the reimbursement code that exists in the market currently? Um, let's see here. Uh, the Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System, the HCPCS system, encompasses a lot of these code sets. Um, in the U.S., healthcare insurers process over 3.3 billion claims for payment. Um, HICPIX was determined for insurance companies uh, to be able to uh, actually process these claims that happen um, every single day. Uh, category one codes um, are, again, they have sort of a, an alphanumeric coding system um, and then uh, descriptive terms that are in there. Um, these category one codes are developed into six sections, uh, evaluation and management, that's like your standard physician, clinician time, code, anesthesia, surgery, radiology, pathology and laboratory, and general medicine is the technical last terminology there. The place where these codes sit um, also influence the likelihood that any given insurance company will actually pay for it. Um, evaluation and management codes are some of the most common codes built throughout the U.S. healthcare system. So um, we like to try and map into e &M codes if we can for certain technologies and procedures, but most of the time that doesn't work for very niche specific medical devices. Um, when you're requesting a new CPT code, the CPT editorial panel meets three times a year. Um, and so that's something that is very surprising um, to some of our companies that we meet with because they want to go apply for it right now. But we actually, you know, there, there's some built in delays here, of sort of four month periods of time where, um, you know, that's something that needs to get built into your timeline when you're thinking about going to market, especially if you raise money and you're building a budget. Um, like these are some of the little steps that we need to actually get built into that budget to make sure that that cash actually can expand into that period of time that it's going to take to get all of these steps handled. Can't control it. There's no magic button. Um, you know, the CPT code editorial panel meets when the CPT code editorial panel meets. Um, requesting a new CPT code, uh, you need to have FDA approval first. Um, then, and we can do research ahead of time. So 
um, like we can look and see if this is going to be a big lift for the new CBT code or if we can find existing codes that we're, we're satisfied with. Um, the service procedure um, is going to have to be performed across the country by many physicians or healthcare providers in multiple locations. So you do have to suggest to the CBT code group that this is something that you know many people will want to do, and it's not just going to be a single physician that developed the technology. Um, and then the clinical efficacy has to be well established and documented in at least three U.S. peer-reviewed journals. It's not an absolute rule, but um, that's that's typically the the standard that's been set. Um, level two HICPICS codes, this is a standardized coding system that's primarily used to identify products, supplies, and services not included in CPT codes. So that would be durable medical equipment, prosthetics and orthotics, supplies, ambulance services, and some specialty drugs and biologics. Um, and so this is where a lot of our clients end up um, with their particular technologies. So if you fit sort of one of these categories here, then you'll be in sort of a level two HICPICS coding system, um, which, you know, we, we navigate every single day. There are also miscellaneous codes um, that are used to bill for services. Um, so a lot of our customers will end up with a miscellaneous code and then you know, they can have their users actually bill for the item um, as soon as it's allowed to be marketed by the FDA. But um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna get paid for, but you know, those physicians can work it out with the insurance companies when they're actually using the technology or prescribing that technology as needed. Um, you can request a modification to the HICPICS level two code. So um, you, any supplier, manufacturer, technology developer may um, submit a request for coding modification. So um, you can ask uh, three things. You can ask that a code be added because there's no good code that describes your technology. You can ask that the language used to describe an existing code be changed. And then you can ask that an existing code be deleted. Um, so if you get mapped into like an older code because the description that somebody determined the description matches your technology, but there's a new code that you think is a better fit, you may ask for that other code to be deleted so that you can be routed into um, the proper category. Most of the time we're asking for codes to be added. Um, although sometimes the industry of a particular type of product get together and say they want to use the change the language used to describe the code. Um, requirements for a new code to be added. Um, there has to be no distinct code that describes the product. So that's where you go to those descriptions and you're sitting there really looking through to see what matches and what doesn't. Product has to be approved by the FDA to be marketed and the service and procedure has to be proved across, uh, per performed across the country by many physicians um, or healthcare providers. ICD-10 codes, um, these are the diagnosis codes. Um, you can, they're publicly available. You can Google them, look for diagnosis codes that are appropriate to define the condition or what you're working on um, with your technology or innovation. Um, so they're used by everybody in the country um, to uh, sort of universally classify conditions, diseases. Um, they are required to submit claims for payments. So um, like a lot of times insurance companies will create medical policies and they'll say this device or technology can be paid for. Here is the rate, but only for these conditions. So you have to submit the claim for if your device is used for uh, essential hypertension, then you need to be able to submit that particular IC10 code with your device code on that claim form um, such that uh, it, it does fit their requirements um, and they will review it. And if it's not the right condition per their medical policy, then they will, um, they'll, they'll, they'll deny the claim. Um, Let's see here, procedure classification systems. So these are the official system of assigning codes to procedures associated with hospital utilization in the United States. So um, these codes uh, are slightly different. Um, they're developed by CMS for classifying um, what's going on inside the actual hospital. Um, they're not based on sort of the, the standard uh, international coding accepted system, but these are specific to how Medicare wants to pay for certain services within the hospital. Um, DRGs, so DRGs group patients according to inpatient hospital services um, on a rate per discharge basis that varies according to the DRG to which a beneficiary stay is assigned. Um, so the formula to calculate payment for a specific case multiplies an individual hospital's payment rate per case by the weight of the DRG to which the case is assigned. This is a very complex 
calculation and you know there's people who are absolute experts in drgs on our team and i can tell you the truth is i'm really not the right person to talk to you about drgs i know enough to be dangerous but um there's people who really understand how every single drg is calculated and how it varies across the country um but essentially the drg weight represents the average resources required to care for cases in that particular drg um, relative to the average resources used to treat cases in all DRGs. So Medicare has basically established a baseline of sort of what they would want to pay for um, everything as it relates to hospital inpatient setting of care. And then um, when something is a little bit more expensive, then they add more weight to a particular DRG. And that's also where um, that technology enhancement um, payment can come into play where you can actually add a multiplier to the DRG um, for a particular technology that gets added into that diagnostic related grouping. So if your technology improves upon something that falls under a particular DRG, we can add that to the coding system um, to allow for that increased payment. Ambulatory payment classification. So this is hospital outpatient setting of care. Um, so these are very similar to DRGs. They're often prospective payments. Um, and they're typically set rates for particular procedures. Um, this helps the facilities, I mean, the, the payers control costs associated with expensive surgical procedures um, and allows them a little bit more predictability in terms of uh, cost inflation. And uh, so we're not gonna go into this right now. Um, I'm gonna get to some of these last slides here. Um, okay, so when we're thinking about launching a company, um, there's there's sort of a typical time to market here, and it usually goes like this. Um, you have your product R&D, maybe it's funded by an SBIR grant, maybe you've done some of the background research from other NIH funding sources or private, uh, private grants, um, you've done that work, and you say, okay, we have something here, we know that it works, we've published some papers on it, um, we're ready to think about spinning this out as a company. Um, that's when we start to go through that regulatory and reimbursement pathway process. So um, we start to identify what do we need to do with the FDA and what do we expect from the reimbursement process based on the current system. Then we start to ask ourselves, do we want to go after a new code? And we can add that to sort of this overall product plan here. Um, we want to do both of those at the same time, because if if you don't do it, because a lot of people will say, I just have to get through the FDA and then I'll think about the business. Um, you're going to waste time and then you'll run out of money. Um, and so like, that's usually what we tell our clients is we really want to start thinking about that early and make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success when we actually do get to market. Um, we'll also start doing go-to-market planning once we start moving through the FDA process at a faster clip and we have a good idea of reimbursement. So then we're ready with potential marketing materials. We're ready with uh, pricing strategy, marketing strategy, and distribution strategy. Okay, um, these are the, the pieces that we do during a reimbursement assessment. So we do a coding assessment. We do a competitive analysis of what's going on with potential other uh, technologies that address your particular use case or um, sort of indication of use. Um, we look at sort of the clinical evidence that you already have. And we look at the clinical evidence that you may need to get so that we're thinking about reimbursement. Um, or I should say we're thinking about clinical evidence through a reimbursement lens, um, which is also sort of a business lens to some extent. And then we're looking clearly at that regulatory pathway. So I'll stop here and see if there's any questions. Um, I know I've gone for quite a while. Um, so uh, any questions put them in the chat um, and I'll, I'll kind of try and address them. But like I said, it, this is one of the hard, <laughs> hardest things to uh, actually navigate because um, like you can talk about it in broad terms, but that doesn't always help companies that are looking for specific answers because there's a lot of nuance and details that, that just can never be communicated in a single presentation. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, also just want to encourage any of our um, researchers who are on, because we have a little bit more time, who are on and have specific case studies, examples of your startup, if you have specific startup questions, um, feel free to ask them here. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. That was super interesting. Um, wondering what the pathway looks like when you have a, a device, and I think it's very common nowadays that is, um, you know, that involves instrumentation as as well as software. Mm -hmm. So, which one do you right? Uh, maybe it's a class one software and class two instrumentation. What what do you do? 
Yeah, so that's what my area of expertise is actually. Um, so you asked the right person for that one. Um, so there's kind of this emerging, uh, like I would say, let me let me back up here really quick. Pretty much every hardware medical device company in the country is exploring ways that they can add electronic measurements and software to their technologies now. Um, and so we typically will go through the same coding process and procedure for the hardware itself because it's a measurement device. And then we'll often look for procedures or um, like CPT codes that actually fit the interpretation or the evaluation of the data collected from the hardware. Um, and so sometimes you can actually have a business model where you get paid for the durable medical equipment or the, the medical device itself. And there's kind of an ongoing procedure that's going on um, associated with the software. So maybe a physician is reviewing the data that comes out of your device, right? Um, that's a reimbursable service now. So um, we've had a lot of fun um, actually helping companies with those types of technologies um, get paid for the hardware, but they're really making higher margin revenue off of the software. Um, and so that's been really from, from a business perspective. Um, from a regulatory perspective, uh, it depends what they're doing with the software. A lot of times we get the software to be exempt from FDA and we get the hardware to go through the typical FDA class two process. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, you know, uh, the remote physiological yes. monitoring code set um, has opened up this door for a lot of medical device companies to be able to actually have that connected component. And clinically speaking, uh, a lot of times it solves some big problems. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, I can share my contact information. Let me. Great. You want to share it? Yeah. In the chat now, that'd be great. And people can. There we go. Okay. My email is. Um, so I'm just Rob at jgsgroup.com. Um, and uh, like I said, the, this is a very specialized area. So um, like some of the stuff I said today may not apply to you. You may think that it's a little bit too general. Um, so send me an email. I can route you to the appropriate people on the team to speak with um, if it's not me. Um, like I said, not an expert at, at inpatient reimbursement, but very good at outpatients and uh, telemedicine and digital, digital tools and genetic diagnostics. Diagnostics. Okay, any other questions? Great, if not, um, we will be sending out uh, this video and the presentation, so you'll have that. Um, and make sure to write down Robert's contact info, we'll send it out as well. Thank you everyone for coming, and as always, stop by the Texas Innovation Center for a coffee, for a chat. Um, we'd love to see you and hear from you. So thanks for joining. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.